This lecture is also about the uplink, but now we will start to simplify things. I will talk about something called favorable propagation, which is a phenomenon that is appearing when we have many antennas and serve multiple users. And that will allow us to use simpler signal processing methods than the one we have covered so far. In particular, we will use maximum ratio or MR processing, even if we have multiple users. And we will also consider a simpler capacity lower bound that is called the use and then forget technique. And we can get a closed form, very informative expression when using maximum ratio processing along with this capacity bound. So to start off, let's recall some of the results about the sum capacity that I've been talking about previously. In particular for the case when we have two users, then the uplink sum capacity when we have a channel matrix G that contains columns G1 and G2 had the following form. The rate of user 1 plus the rate of user 2 is equal to the log 2 of the determinant of an identity matrix of size 2. So we have two users. Then we have row uplink, which is some kind of SNR. And then we have a product between the channel matrix and the Hermitian transpose of itself. And this product will result in a 2 by 2 matrix that is containing the following four elements. On the diagonal, we get one of the channel vectors in squared norm. And on the off diagonal elements, we get the inner product between one of the channel vectors and the other channel vector. And in this case here, we have M antennas at the base stations. All of these vectors are M dimensional. Then if we expand this determinant here, we have an identity matrix here plus this matrix. So we should take the diagonal elements, which is one times row uplink times this norm here. And then we have the other diagonal element, which is one plus row uplink times this norm here. So we get the product of these two terms. And then to compute the determinant, we also need to take the off diagonal element, multiply them together and subtract that term. And we get nothing from the identity matrix, but here we are getting row uplink twice. And we get the inner product between G2 and G1 and the other way around. So we get the absolute value square of that term. And since this is a term that is subtracted, the logarithm will become smaller whenever this is a non-zero term, which means that we will get a larger sum capacity whenever the inner product between the two channel vectors is equal to zero. Then we can take away this part here and we can take the log two of this product and write it as the log of one plus the log of the other one. And this is actually the point to point capacity that we're having for one user and for the second user and we just add them up. So in this case, when the two channel vectors are orthogonal to each other, the two users can get a capacity which is equal to what they would get if they were alone in the system. They are not interfering with each other. One way of illustrating this is by looking at the capacitor region. When the two channel vectors are non-orthogonal, then we have a capacity for user 2 and a capacity for user 1 when they are alone in the system, but then this term here is punishing us so we cannot achieve both of them at the same time. We get this type of trade-off here where this part of the uh, region is cut off. But when they are instead orthogonal to each other, both of the users can get their maximum capacity at the same time. So the capacity region is a square like this. So it is preferred to have channel vectors that are orthogonal to each other. And that is why we call this favorable propagation. So a collection of channel vectors, GK, are said to offer favorable propagation if we can take two different vectors, K and I. So they are not the same and they are between one and K. So we have a set of K vectors. And when we take two different channel vectors, we compute our inner product, it becomes zero. So when that happens, we get favorable propagation and these K users can communicate as if they were alone in the system, even if they're transmitting at the same time and frequency, thanks to the fact that their channel vectors are orthogonal, which allows the base station to separate them very easily in space. Unfortunately, this is never satisfied exactly in practice or very seldomly at least, but there is something that can be satisfied, namely an asymptotic version of it, which we call asymptotically favorable propagation. And that is that we take the inner product of two different channel vectors. So still K and I are from one to capital K and they're selected to be different. And then we compute their inner product. We normalize now with the number of antennas. 
And this number can become zero asymptotically when we are adding more and more antennas into the system. And one way of motivating that is that when you add more antennas, so your array become larger, you get the smaller and smaller beam width. So that means that you're sending the signals into smaller and smaller parts of space. And so you direct your signals more and more. So if the users are not at the same locations, well, then it makes good sense that as you add more antennas, it will be easier to separate them. And asymptotically, something like this is going to be satisfied. And we will now show that this is something that is going to happen when you have ID rarely fading channels. And to show that, we will use a result called the law of large numbers, which is a mathematical statistic result, which is saying that if we have a sequence, x1, x2, and so on, uh, that is containing independent and identically distributed random variables. And since these variables are identically distributed, they have the same mean value. So the expected value of xi is equal to something we call mu, and it doesn't matter which index i we're considering. And also, their variance is going to be the same, so let's call it sigma square, and we also assume that it's smaller than infinity. So we have a finite variance that is the same for all of these indices i. Then if we compute the sample average, which is to sum up x1, x2, up to xn, so we have n different terms in the sequence now, and we divide with the number of them, that is a definition of a sample average, and we denote it like this, x bar n. Then this is going to converge to the expected value, uh, so it's going to be mu here, as the number of terms in the sample average goes towards infinity. So this is known as the law of large numbers, and there is a strong and a weak version of it where this convergence here can have different meanings. Whenever you deal with convergence and a sequence of random variables, then there are different ways of defining convergence. But the important thing here is not what definition we are using, but the fact that as we add more and more elements to the sequence, then we are getting something that is in some way or another closer to the mean value. And one reason that we are getting something like this is that if we compute the variance of the sample average, then since we have independent variables, we can get this as a variance of each of these elements. And then since we have a 1 over n term multiplied with each one of them, when you pull that out of a variance, you get the square of it. So we should divide by n square here instead. And each of these terms here have a variance that was called sigma square. We have n of them, but we have an n square here. So the variance of the sample average is going to be uh, sigma square divided by n, which means that as we add more terms into the sample average, the variance goes down and when it approaches zero, well, then we are going to have something that is close to its mean value. The law of large numbers can be used to analyze the properties of Rayleigh fading channels, where we have a channel vector, gk, that is uh, having a variance beta k, so it has a mean value zero and the variance is beta k, which is going to be smaller than infinity. And as we are adding more and more antennas, well, then we get the sequence within this vector that is longer and longer, that contains more and more terms. And when we are computing the squared norm of the channel vector and divide with the number of terms, well, then this is a sample average of the absolute value squares from this vector here. And when we add more and more terms into the vector, we can apply the law of large number to say that this should converge to the mean value of each of the individual absolute value squares. And that is equal to the variance. So this is something that we call channel hardening, that we take the squared norm of the channel, we divide with the number of elements, and this converges to the variance of the channel as the number of antennas goes to infinity. And this is sort of a consequence of the diversity gains that we've been talking about earlier. It's an extreme form of that. So we will get a deterministic channel gain here eventually when you add more and more antennas into the system. Then we have another property that is even more important to us, this favorable propagation or asymptotic favorable propagation. So if we are taking the inner product between two ch different channel vectors, we divide with the number of elements, well then 
This is also going to be a summation of our m terms. Each of them contains one element from one vector times one element from the other vector. So it's a sample average of something like that. And that should then converge to the mean value. And mean value of what? Well, each of these terms here in the summation is going to be one term from gk, one term from gi. If you compute the mean value, each of them are independent of each other, they have mean value zero, so that's why it converged to zero. So in summary, for ID Rayleigh fading channels of this type here, we have these following approximations when the number of antennas is large. The square norm divided with number of antennas is approximately equal to beta k, and the inner product between two channel vectors divided by m is approximately equal to zero. And we would like to use these properties in order to design our signal processing in a much simpler way, in a way that should work well when we have a lot of antennas. The problem is that we don't know the channel, so we can't, for example, multiply with gk in order to expose terms like this. Instead, we know the estimated channels only at the receiver side. So what I will talk about next is the channel estimates, and then we'll try to develop the same results again. So remember, in the last lecture I was talking about the MMC estimate of a channel, gkm from user k to antenna m. We are calling the estimate g hat km, and we compute it by taking this y prime p, which is the received signal from the pilot transmission after the despreading operation, and we are multiplying with the factor here. And uh, the important thing is that this is going to be a complex Gaussian distribution, having zero mean and gamma k, which is something that is smaller than the original beta k, which is the variance of the channel. And here is the expression for gamma k. And we have an estimation error, which we call g tilde km. It's the estimate minus the true value. And this one have the variance beta k minus gamma k. So when gamma k is very close to beta k, we have a small estimation error variance. And when we move on now, let's put these elements in vectors. So we form a estimated channel vector g hat k, which is containing g hat k1 to g hat km. So these are the estimated channels from antenna 1 to m with respect to user k. And all of them have the same variance, gamma k. So this is going to be like a really fading channel with gamma k as a variance, but it's actually the estimated channel vector that have the same type of distribution with just a different variance. And the estimation errors, we put them in a vector g tilde k, and we take each of the elements in the same way we put them into the vector. They are independent of each other, and they are complex Gaussian, so it's sort of like having a Rayleigh fading channel vector that is the estimation error, but now it has a different variance, beta k minus gamma k. So consider these channel vectors now. They are g hat k, they are like a Rayleigh fading channel, but they have a different variance, gamma k. Then this channel estimate will also offer channel hardening in the sense that if you take the squared norm of it, you divide with number of elements, then you are going to approach the variance of each of these elements here, namely gamma k, as the number of antennas goes to infinity. And this holds for all of different uses. So it is sort of the same type of channel hardening that we had for the true channels, we just converge to a different number. The channel estimates are also offering asymptotically favorable propagation in the sense that if you take two different estimates, you compute your inner product and you divide with the number of elements, then this is going to converge to zero in the same way as the, what's happening for the true channels. So when we have a large number of antennas, m, then the squared norm of a channel estimate divided with the number of antennas will be approximately equal to the variance of one element. And the inner product between two channel estimates divided with the number of antennas will be approximately equal to zero. And this is expressions of a kind that we can actually expose in our received signals. And I will now show you how to do that. So first, just remember the capacity lower bound that I was talking about in the previous lecture, where we have a transmitter signal x, we are multiplying with a power rho, so we have a square root of rho here, we have some kind of channel coefficient g, and then we add some scalar noise term here, w, 
So the received signal y is equal to the square root of rho times g times x plus w. And the task of the receiver is to estimate x. So it provides some kind of x hat. And it does it using some channel information that it has, that we call omega, and of course the received signal. And we assume that the desired signal x and g and w are uncorrelated, given the channel information that we're having. Then we have this capacity lower bound with an expectation in front of a logarithm. So it looks very much as the ergodic capacity type of expression that we were used to in the point to point case, but this is not the exact ergodic capacity, but a lower bound on it. And within the logarithm, we have one plus a signal to interference and noise ratio that contains the channel here in the numerator, the part of the channel that we are knowing. So expected value of G given the information we have omega, we have an absolute value square, and then we multiply with the power rho. And then here we have a variance of the channel knowledge that we're having, so g given omega, plus the variance of this interference or noise term here, uh, given the omega that we're having. Let's now particularize this for the case when g is a constant channel. So if g is deterministic, so it's a constant and we know it, then we can greatly simplify this complicated expression that we had before. Because if g is deterministic and known, then the expected value of g is just g. And there is no variance, variance is zero, so that term disappears. And if the thing that we know is the number of a deterministic channel coefficient, well then the variance of w given something that is deterministic doesn't change anything, so we just get the variance of w. And the expected value here, which is computed with respect to omega, the randomness exists in our channel state information. Uh, so if the channels are changing over time and we're knowing all the time what the channel realization is or a part of it, then this expectation is computed with respect to that. But now we have a deterministic channel, so we can just throw it away. So we get log two or one plus rho absolute value square of g and then divide with the variance w. We will now rewrite the uplink signals that we are receiving in order to utilize this upper expression, which might sound a bit weird, but you will see soon what I'm meaning. So look now at the received signal during the uplink data transmission. We call it Y, and it is a summation over all of the uses that are transmitting. The signals are arriving over their channel vectors, GK. They are transmitting with the power rho uplink, which is a maximum power, multiplied with eta k, which is the power control coefficient of user k. And then we have this data signal qk. And we add the noise w. Then gk is containing the true channel, and we can separate it into the estimated part that we know and the estimation error that we don't know. So we can write this as a similar type of term here, but with g k hat instead. And then we need to subtract a similar type of term, but now with g tilde k. So g hat minus g tilde is giving us the true channel. So we haven't changed anything, we have just rearranged terms. And why do we do that? Well, now this is the useful part. The receiver knows the channel estimate, and that gives it a possibility of extracting information from qk. And this part here, when we don't know the estimation error, we don't know what the noise is, and we still don't know what the data signal is. This is typical and unusable part. There are very advanced algorithms that can extract information from a part like this as well, but we will give up on that. We want to have a simple type of receiver, so we will just view this as being an unusable part, and I will now call it W prime. Then, just as we did in the previous lecture, we assign the receiver filter AI for user I. And the, a receiver filter is also known as a detection vector or a combining vector, for example. There are many names for the same type of thing. The important thing is that we are taking this vector and we compute an inner product with the received signal Y. We will use this notation here and focus first on the term in the summation that is from the desired user, user I, where we get G hat I, and here we have eta I, and here we have QI. So we write this here and we get an inner product with the receiver filter AI. Then we take the rest of this term now with the summation over everything except K being equal to I. And I write down the same expression here again 
and now we get an inner product between a channel estimate and AI. And finally, we have this unusable part that I call W prime. We get an inner product between that one and AI as well. So here we have a design part. From this one, we would like to extract information for user I signal QI is here, and we have this part here, which is representing the channel and the power. And then we have this other part here, which is representing interference. And finally, we have some unusable part that is some kind of interference and noise term as well. Let's now focus on the desired signal part. Suppose we would like to make it as large as possible. Then we are considering this Q hat i, and we are looking at the absolute value of this in the product between a i and Q hat i. And we would like to select AI in a way to ma make it as large as possible. And so we can always increase the norm of AI. So let's uh, make sure that we are normalizing this term by the norm of AI. So we are, we are not playing around with just making this norm as large as possible. Then we can use the cauchy schwarz inequality in order to say how we should maximize this ratio. So I write it here. When we have an inner product between two vectors and um, with an absolute value on it, then the cauchy schwarz inequality is saying that this is going to be smaller than taking the norm of each of the vector and multiplying them together. And then remember that we were dividing with the norm of AI here as well. So those two terms are canceling out each other. Then the maximum value here is the norm of G hat I. And the cauchy schwarz inequality is also saying when do we achieve this largest value? Well, that happens when the two vectors that we are considering in a product between happen to be parallel, which when it comes to complex vectors, uh, meaning that AI is equal to Q hat I multiplied with some constant C, which is non-zero. It can be any complex number as long as it's non-zero. So with this in mind, we can say that if you would like to make the desired part of our received signal as large as possible, then we should select our receiver filter to be equal to our channel estimate of the same user multiplied with a constant. And all of the uh, receiver filter this kind we will call maximum ratio processing. We came across something very similar when we were working in the point-to-point -point Simon case with perfect uh, channel knowledge. In that case we selected our combining vector which we call maximum ratio combining as being the channel divided by the norm. So in that case C is equal to 1 divided by the norm of the channel here. But in general we can have any value of C. So based on this, say that we are mainly interested in making the desired signal part and our received signal as large as possible. Then we can select AI to be equal to the channel estimate multiply with the factor. And let's now select 1 over n as the factor. Then when we compute the inner product between AI and uh, Y, what we will get in our desired singular part here is a uh, inner product between the channel estimate and AI, which is now creating this type of inner product between G hat I and itself. And we divide with the number of elements because that was what we put here. So from that perspective, we have a term here which is approximately equal to gamma k. This is the channel hardening because this is square norm of the channel vectors estimates and here we have number of elements. And the variance then was gamma i. So when we have many antennas, we can expect that this term is going to be very close to gamma i. Then if we look at the interference term here, we get the inner product between another user's channel estimate g hat k and our desired user's channel estimate. And this type of term here where we have divided with the number of antennas is what we were calling asymptotically favorable propagation, namely that when we have many antennas, this is going to zero. So this is approximately zero. And also one can show that the same will hold for this interference term here with w prime it's approximately equal to zero. There are two things that are happening here. One is that the interference term and noise terms are supposed to be rather small when we have a large number of antennas. And the other thing is that even if we have a fading channel, then after we have applied our maximum ratio processing, then the term that we have in front of our desired signal will be approximately equal to a deterministic number. So it is random, but it behaves as being deterministic. 
And that is what we will utilize in order to simplify our processing. And use something that we call the use and then forget technique. So the idea is that we are using our channel estimate to compute the receiver filter. And we apply it, so then we have used it. And after that, we see that this term in front of the desired signal is almost deterministic. So then we don't need to remember our channel estimate anymore. And we are taking this term here and we replace this inner product between the channel and self divided with number of antennas with the gamma k to get this term here, which is sort of a desired signal part with a deterministic channel being gamma i. But we cannot just replace it like that. So we need to uh, instead say that we are adding this term and then we subtract it again. So this term is subtracted here and then we keep the rest of the term. Here we have the actual desired term. Here we have the interference and noise terms written down here. But if we view gamma i as being a deterministic channel and everything else here as being interference and noise, which is uncorrelated with this one, this is something we can prove, then we have applied the use and then forget technique. And we can then go back to this capacity bound with a deterministic channel and say that we are sending a signal x which is in our case qi. We have a transmit power, rho, which is in our case rho uplink times eta i. Then we have a channel g, which is deterministic and known, namely it is gamma i in our case. And then we have some interference noise term w, which is uncorrelated with uh, the desired part here. W is not independent of our desired signal. It actually contains qi multiplied uh, with uh, some different terms, but we are free to choose that we don't want to remember that. We forget about that, we assign a processing that is suboptimal and ignores that. And we do that in order to use this capacity lower bound that I talked about before. Log to a one plus rho times the absolute value square of a deterministic channel divided with the variance of w and w it now needs to be an uncorrelated signal with respect to the desired signal qi. We can now compute this term for our setup. So in the numerator, we have rho times absolute value square of g. And rho was equal to rho uplink times eta i. So that is what we get here. And g was gamma i, so we get the gamma i square. And when it comes to the variance of w, it uh, takes quite some time to compute the variance of all the different terms that are going around there. Uh, you can find the full derivation in the book Fundamentals of Massive MIMO. But what you will get is a uh, gamma i divided by m. So this is sort of representing what is coming from our maximum ratio processing. And then we get this term where we have a summation over all of the users, including the desired user, because we don't know the channel perfectly. So we are getting some kind of self-interference from that. Then we have rho uplink, eta k. This is the transmit power of user k. We have beta k, the variance of the true channel of user k. And then we have a plus one. And when computing the ratio between these two terms, two things are going to happen. We have one gamma i square here and we have a gamma i here. So that gamma i is taking away the square. And then we have an m term here and we will move this to the numerator because this is representing a beamforming gain. So in summary, we have a capacity bound that we have computed for maximum ratio processing using this use and then forget technique. And it looks like this. The capacity of user i is smaller or equal to log 2 or 1 plus. We have a numerator and we have a denominator. And we call this a closed form expression because there is no expectations left to compute. And we have done quite some work in order to achieve that. We had to assume maximum ratio processing and the use and then forget technique. Both of them are simplified techniques. They are not the optimal things that we were driving in the last lecture, but they are providing us with this very insightful expression where there is no small scale fading left that we need to compute expectations with respect to. So if we look at the numerator, we have here m, which is the number of antennas. So this is the coherent beamforming gain. The same thing as we've seen before. And then we have the power, rho uplink times eta i, natural that one will show up in the signal term. And then we have gamma i, the variance of the estimation quality. We can also view m times gamma i as being the expected value of the square norm of the channel estimate. So this is what's happening in the numerator. 
we get something that is increasing with number of antennas and then it's proportional to some kind of signal to noise ratio for each of the individual antennas but not using the true variance of the channel but the variance of the channel estimate. Then in the denominator we have two terms. The one here is the noise variance which is normalized to one and this term here is an interference term and we see that it is containing a summation over all users including the desired one, their transmit power and their variance of the channel. It might look like we have a large amount of interference here because we get the full transmit power, we get the actual variance of the channel and not something that depends on the estimate. But the important thing is that this is not scaling with the number of antennas. This is a so-called non-coherent interference term. So as we are using more and more antennas to receive things, we are amplifying our desired signal. That was the whole purpose with maximum ratio processing, but we are not amplifying the interference term. So as we increase the number of antennas, this interference term is staying the same while the numerator is increasing linearly with the number of antennas. So this is how the capacity expression works when we have a maximum ratio processing and we apply the use and then forget technique. In summary, when we have many antennas, two important phenomena are appearing. The first thing is channel hardening, which means that the channel quality becomes approximately constant even if we have a fading channel. And mathematically it means here that if we take the estimate of the channel vector gk hat, we compute the squared norm and we divide with number of antennas, it's approximately equal to gamma k. And the second thing is favorable propagation, which means that the inner product of the estimates of two different users are almost zero, in particular when we devour with the number of antennas, it's approximately zero. And this motivates us to use maximum ratio processing at the receiver side, even if we have multiple users, because the interference will blow. And we can use the use and then forget technique in order to compute a lower bound on the capacity. In that way we are pretending that the channel is deterministic, even if it isn't, and that we can do thanks to the channel hardening. And in particular, this capacity bounding technique allows to compute a closed form expression that tells us how the system is behaving when we are using maximum ratio processing.